right, Crossroads, we continue on celebrating Mother's Day. Can we just one more time give it up for all the ladies today? We are celebrating you today. And this is a fun day. This is a fun day to celebrate and to just lean in to what I think is a really important question. And so no matter where you are today, whether you're in this room joining us or online or in Mishawaka, St. Pete, Nashville, wherever you are, I want you to know this is a question that we need to lean in today and, and just really be intentional in thinking about putting it into practice in our lives. And that question is this, it's how do I lead my family toward Jesus. Can we just stop and think about that and consider the ramifications? Because I think at the end of the day, the answer to this question, how we live this out, it's really, really significant because this has eternal consequences. When, when I am able to lead my family toward Jesus, that's the recognition that I am passing my faith on to the next generation, that that ripple of faith through eternity continues to grow and to affect change. Uh, here at Crossroads, right now, we are focused on inviting as many people as we can to a changed life because we're recognizing that there are people all around us who are desperate for hope. And I think that now more than ever before, we've got to take seriously the responsibility that we have to lead our families toward Jesus. And as we consider what that looks like and grapple with that today, I want to encourage you out of the gate because you're doing better than you think you are, all right? So whether you're a mom here today or you're an aunt or a grandma or you're just that awesome person speaking life into the next generation, know this. Everybody is a hero to somebody. I mean, look at the person next to you. As weird as that is, that person's a hero. Just know that, all right? That person is a hero. You're like, nope. Then look the other way. Look the other way. Maybe that person. That person's a hero. Uh, everybody is a hero. Some of you are deeply offended. You're like, what? I'm just kidding. Everybody is a hero to somebody. And listen, to that person, what you say, what you do, it has a huge amount of influence. And I want to encourage you today to, to lean in to the influence that you have to the people in your life and to think about what you can do to be intentional about leading your family, leading your loved ones toward Jesus. Because I would challenge you today with the idea there really isn't a better legacy than that. That's the mission that all of us have. We are here to connect people with Jesus. And when we encounter Jesus, when we realize that God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it, that's an unbelievable truth that we just absolutely embrace and it changes us. And then there's the reality, right? We talk about this all the time. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to become more like him. And I'm convinced now more than ever that that journey that he calls us to is just daily surrender. It's every day. It's whatever the question is, whatever the, the step of faith that God is calling me to out of my comfort zone, whatever that is, the answer is yes. If my answer is always yes to Jesus, I'm going to find myself exactly where he created me to be. And I want you to know today you can start. It's never too early. It's never too late. Start today where you're at and start taking steps toward Jesus just by saying yes. And I think that this whole journey of leading our families to Jesus, it begins with that mindset. It begins with that attitude. Because if you are saying yes to Jesus, then it's going to happen. And I want to encourage you with that today. You're doing better than you think you are. So let's take a moment before we dive in and celebrate the ladies today. Proverbs 31 talks about the celebration of the virtuous woman. These writings talk about the, the qualities of like the perfect woman, all right? So think about that. Ladies, this is the description of the perfect woman. Lean in. Guys, you're looking for the right one? Listen up. This is important, all right? This is gold. It says in Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, <clears throat> she is clothed with strength and dignity. And she laughs without fear of the future. She's prepared. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household, which sounds kind of creepy, right? Like, she's always watching. <laughs> she carefully watches everything in her household. <laughs> Raise your hand if your mom was like that. I like, can't get away with anything. Okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, and suffers nothing from laziness. She is getting it done. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. 
Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Let's give it up for all the ladies today, all right? Let's publicly <laughs> praise our ladies today. Now, that is good stuff. And I, I want to challenge you today. Man, when you have that realization that, man, these are the character traits. This is the life that God has called us to. There's this really important realization that we have to embrace of now it's, it's our job to pass that on to the next generation. This is our time. Nobody else does that for us. We've got to step up in the place that God has created us for and do our part to pass on that legacy of faith, to lead our families toward Jesus. And I want to walk through some practical steps today of how we can do that, how we can use our influence to point people toward Jesus. And I want to do that by looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 7. This is Paul writing to Timothy, who he has mentored. Timothy is a leader who's grown in the church and has a huge amount of influence. But Paul is his mentor, and he's speaking life into him. And he starts this letter by saying this, Timothy, I thank God for you. That's my life verse. I put that on my wall. It's like God speaking to me. Timothy, I thank God for you. I'm just kidding. I, just, can I have fun with that? My name's Tim. Okay. <laughs> Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I think this is really significant. I think Paul puts this in this letter for a reason. Number one, he's identifying that he sees real, genuine, authentic faith in Timothy. He is living it out. His faith, his relationship with God has changed him, and he's recognizing that. But he's saying really importantly, hey, that faith was first in your grandmother Lois. Like we all saw that in Lois, and then she passed that faith on to your mother Eunice. Like he's going, hey, this is a generational thing. Lois had the faith, then Eunice had the faith, now you have the faith. That has been passed on to you. And that's an important event cycle that we need to just lean into and identify, that's the role that all of us play in our families, and it makes a huge difference. And I think it starts with this mindset that we have to approach our families, our children, our nieces and nephews, our grandchildren, we have to approach them with this idea that I am called to surrender my family to God. It starts with surrender. It's, it's every part of my life is labeled and marked by surrender. And that overlaps into our families. And what a beautiful and sacred moment that is that we get to share together when we dedicate our children to God. I mean, what an amazing thing that is. I will never forget the moment when we had Carter. I became a parent, and that moment changed everything. You know, suddenly the calm nights, just never, every night's a date night when you're just a couple, right? Yay! And then you have kids, and everything changes. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? You know. We love our children. We love our, we do. But those were good days. I mean, let's just be honest. We, we all slept, slept more. And I tease, I kid. When, when we had Carter, there was that instant realization that life just got a lot more meaningful. Man, it gets a little bit heavier because you realize now I'm responsible for this little baby. I, I have been entrusted with the care of an eternal soul. Like, that gets heavy really quickly. And there's this realization that, oh my goodness, I can't try to do this on my own. No, God, I'm, you've blessed me with this extraordinary gift that we're giving Carter right back to you. What a beautiful moment that is that we get to share together as a church family, that, that dedication moment where we say, God, our, our most prized possessions, our dearest treasures, we're gifting them right back to you. And that mindset changes everything. When I surrender my family to God, that changes everything. You talk about changing a trajectory and making a difference for generations to come. My goodness, that's where that begins. That happened in my family. I've shared this before, but I share it all the time because I think it matters. My families, when we talk about the greats, like my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, they weren't really good people. The Fisher family was known for hanging out with outlaws, the Frank and Jesse James gang. That's what we grew up hearing about. We ran with Frank and Jesse James. We... Our fishers, we go to jail. It's like, okay, awesome. That's our, that's our legacy. And, and, and my grandpa, Fisher, uh, when he was in his 20s, he encountered Jesus 
and it radically changed his life. And I give God the glory for that. That's an amazing thing because not only did that change his life, it changed the life of my grandmother. They answered a call that God placed on their lives in their 20s to go into ministry, and they gave up everything. They gave up a great lifestyle. They gave it all up to go serve Jesus and answer a call to ministry. And because my grandpa did that, I mean, he had two boys, Richard and Mike, they both became pastors. I grew up in that pastor's household, you know, vowing, God, I will never be a pastor, right? And then that's just kind of the life that was poured into me, right? Like when we're talking about honoring our moms today, my first memories are my mom reading me Bible stories, teaching me uh, the Bible, helping me memorize verses and sing songs. Like, I was trained to be a pastor by the time I was seven. I mean, I didn't really have a choice in the matter when I look back at life, like, whoa, I was ready for this. And the trajectory that changes because of that, because of that attitude of surrender, I want you to know it makes a huge difference. And, and we change our culture, we change, we change our communities by taking care of, of what God has entrusted to our care by surrendering our families to God and making sure that we're passing that faith on to the next generation. And I, I want to just challenge you with something that's heavy on my heart right now. I'm looking at Generation Z right now, and I see an amazing generation. Let's give it up for Generation Z today, all right? The newest generation coming up. I'm excited about what I see in Generation Z. There's some cool cats in that generation. I'm admittedly solidly entrenched in Generation X. I'm now officially starting to feel old. I just want you to know that. But... I, I believe this with all of my heart. I think that the next wave of revival, it comes from Generation Z. I believe that with all my heart. And we need to be lifting that generation up in prayer, doing everything we can to pass this legacy of faith to them. Because we are surrounded by more and more people than ever before who are desperate for hope. We're in a culture that has no purpose, has no meaning, has no hope for a future. Because they've turned away from, from Jesus. He's the one who's the answer to all those things. Jesus is where I find my, my identity. That's where I come from. That's who I am. Jesus is the one who gives my life purpose and meaning. Jesus is the one who gives me hope for a future, an eternal destiny. The answer to everything that we're looking for is Jesus. And listen, when Jesus is missing from the picture in your life, oh man, you live a life without hope. And we're surrounded by people who are desperate for this hope. And we have the answer, you guys. The answer is Jesus. And that's why we're inviting as many outsiders as we can to a changed life because we believe this changes everything. And we want to celebrate that change. We've made it our goal. We, we don't care if it sounds audacious. We want to baptize 1,000 people by the end of 2025 because it's 1,000 people that will have said yes to Jesus and experienced hope. That's what we want. That's our goal here. Yeah, that's worth celebrating. That's what we're about here at Crossroads. We want to invite you to a changed life. So how do we lead our families toward Jesus, the ones that we love the most. How do we pass this faith on to our kids? Well, it starts with the attitude of surrender. I surrender my family to Jesus. And in 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul continues. He says, I know that same faith continues strong in you. How does he know that about Timothy? Well, he sees it. He sees that faith living out. Faith is trust I trust in the promises of Jesus, and then I put that into action. It's, it's trust and obey. Faith is stepping out of obedience, putting into practice the things that God is calling you to. That's what faith is. It's trust and it's action. And he sees that faith alive in Timothy. And I love that because it all comes down to, it starts with the attitude of surrender now, but it, then it continues by setting a good example. Like, people are going to be drawn to what they see as real. If it's not real, they're going to see right through you, okay? If you can set that good example and say, hey, this is what is important to me. Jesus changed my life. And, and they see that in you, there's no denying that. You have an experience. You have, an, you have a story. That changes everything. I want to challenge you today to do everything you can to be setting a good example. Um, your kids are looking up to you. Parents, you have more influence than you realize. It doesn't really matter what phase of life your children end up in. You have influence. What you say and what you do matters. You are still a hero, all right? And, and they're always watching. They're always watching, all right? We can utilize that one twice. They're watching, all the time. And when they come to church, they tell Beth everything you're doing. We keep a notebook. We know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, but it's a good idea. Um, so setting a good example is so important, like living it out. 
Man, you have an audience. Your kids are watching you. Your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, they're watching. And I want to encourage you today, it's never too early and it's never too late to start, okay? And if you're trying, I want you to know you're doing better than you think you are, okay? Keep pressing on. Keep setting that example. And I want to encourage you today with with something that is very interesting to me. What you see in in surveys and, and studies that they've done is that 85% of people who say yes to Jesus, think about this now, 85% of people who say yes to Jesus, they make that decision between the age of 4 and 14. Now think about how significant that is. That means your kids have been watching, they've noticed that you've surrendered the family to Jesus, you're setting that good example, and everything that you've done has pointed them to that moment where they say yes to Jesus. They want to make that faith their own and take that first step, that first yes to Jesus. What an amazing opportunity we have to pour into the lives of our kids and to set that example for them to follow. I want to encourage you today. It's, it's never too early. It's never too late to start. And if you're trying, you're doing better than you think you are. All right? So be encouraged. Setting a good example, what does that look like in the home? I would challenge you with these, these practical solutions. Uh, let your kids see you reading your Bible. How about that? If you're spending time every day in God's Word, which you should be doing, Let them catch you reading the Bible from time to time. Have conversations that center around that. Let them see that that's important to you. Let them see you praying. That's one of the most important traditions we've started in our home. Every night before we go to bed, we gather together in whatever room the most people are in, and we all pray together. We rotate through who prays. We talk about what's going on, who can we pray for. Those have become sacred and beautiful moments in our household. It's a great tradition. And our boys know that's important to us. This is how we end every single day, and we do that together. Invite them in on that experience. Let them see you making church a priority. This is a big one. Uh, I think in, in our culture today, we're seeing church attendance across America kind of become less and less frequent. The average person who goes to church in America uh, only attends 1.4 Sundays a month. And I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know if they come twice, but they leave early one of those times. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Oh, Pastor Tim is not on his A game today. We're heading out early. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. They last 1.4. I want to I challenge you today. Guys, that's not enough. We need this. You need your church family. We worship together. We grow together. We learn together. Guys, we serve together. You're going to get the most out of your relationship with God and this church family the more that you engage. And your kids need to see it in action. Your kids need this community. You have 936 Sundays from 0 to 18, 936. Man, if you only come 1.4 times, you're down to about 250. You've just limited the influence that the church family can have on your kids. Man, make church a priority. And let's shoot for like three, three or 2.8. I don't know if you need to leave a little early, that's okay. But make church a priority. And I think the final piece is let them see you serving God. Let them see you using the gifts and abilities that God gave you because that makes more of a difference than you could possibly know. And take every chance you can to serve together. What an amazing family experience that is when you can serve together. That turns the light on. That helps make that faith come alive when they're, they're engaging and serving right alongside you. These are sacred and beautiful moments that I think are practical ways that we can put this into practice and set a good example for our kids In 2 Timothy 1, Paul continues, he says, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. He's saying, hey, this is why it's important that you use the gifts and abilities that God has given you. You can make a difference for for generations to come. And I want to encourage you here, when it comes to your kids, surrender your family to God, set the good example. But something I learned a long time ago is do everything you can to stack the deck for success. And when I talk about stacking the deck, I'm doing whatever it takes. Get your, get your kids with the people that you see who you respect, the people that you look up to. Get them building relationships with them in their presence. Put them in situations where you know they're going to grow. Surround them with people who love them and who are going to invest in them. 
do every single thing you can to stack the deck for success. And you know what I'm talking about when I say stack the deck, by hook or by crook, make it happen. I remember when I was, uh, I, I think a junior in high school, we took an eight hour van ride to go to camp up in Wisconsin somewhere. And uh, on the way up, we were playing cards, right? Back in those days, Euchre was the game of choice. For anybody play Euchre or is that still a thing? I, I haven't played Euchre in a long time. Uh, but if you wanna win a game of Euchre, it's important that you have a couple jacks, all right? And uh, that's just what you need to know. And so all the way up for eight hours, my buddy and I, we were playing Euchre, and we never lost a game. We never lost in eight hours. And people were like, that's amazing. You guys are really good at this game. Well, we were just dealing each other jacks off the bottom of the deck. That's all we were doing the whole way up. Don't think less of me. It's a long time ago. <laughs> and then we, we told them, we guys, you guys, we were dealing ourselves the best cards the whole trip, and none of you ever caught, it's amazing. Uh, that's a whole other story. But the whole idea is, man, any way you can, stack the deck for success for your kids. Focus on the things that matter, because, man, there's no better legacy. There's no more important thing to invest in than, than our most prized possessions. The kids that we've surrendered to Jesus, let's do everything we can it's within our power to, to get them on a path that's going to help them become the people God created them to be. I would encourage you, uh, focus on character. I think a lot of times we fall into the trap of just simply focusing on achievement, right? Um, but I want you to focus on character when it comes to your kids, helping them become more like Jesus. I was just at a basketball tournament uh, last Saturday with Jake. He's in a sixth grade team that was up in Michigan, and uh, they won their first two games. It was great, just feeling great about himself. And then the third game, it was just a difficult game, physical game, a lot of trash talking, and they came up just short. And on the ride home, which, you know, as soon as you're eliminated, it's like, okay, guys, see you later. You're all losers. Bye. And then uh, on the way home, <laughs> for the first 20, 30 minutes, I mean, Jake won't talk. Like, hey, buddy, how you feeling? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Would you like to feel better? There's a great restaurant right off the exit here. Let's, let's, uh, let's feel better eating a delicious lunch. And then we talked about it. You know, what was difficult about that? Why are you angry? Why are you upset? What's important? And, you know, I always try to reaffirm my kids in those moments. Man, I love that you love this. I love that you love basketball. I love that you're doing great at it. That's awesome. But I'm, I'm much more interested in, in your heart, your character, how you're, how you're processing this stuff. And those are great teaching moments. Don't let the anger overwhelm you. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. I want to teach character in those moments. And honestly, if my kid comes out of that with better character, that's probably the best case scenario anyway, because we fishers aren't that talented when it comes to sports. <laughs> uh, but the, the character is what matters, right? Focus on character and utilize every situation you can to teach, teach your kids in those moments. And I would say embrace the crucial conversations. I mean, you've got to be willing to lean into those awkward moments when you maybe you don't even feel like you know what you're talking about or know what the right answer is or what the right thing is to say. I challenge you, man, your voice has more influence and it carries more weight than you know. Lean into those moments. Figure it out with your kids. Sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know, and, and walk through that with them, but embrace those crucial conversations and lean into those moments with them because they're looking for you to, to have the, the words of wisdom. They're looking for your guidance and you can figure it out along the way with them. It's gonna be a little bit overwhelming. It's gonna be a little bit scary, but embrace those moments. And I think the, the final piece is when we talk about stacking the deck, you got to be willing to, to display committed love. I think it's so important that our kids know that the love that we have for them, it's got to be that, that deepest kind of love, the same kind of love that God has for us, that, that love that says, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Man, I think about God's grace that he has shown us and that realization that our kids, as, as they transition, they go from being the littles to being the teenagers to being adult kids, Man, there, there is a, a depth and, and there is a, a richness that comes from relationships with, with children who know that they are, are loved no matter what. And I want to encourage you, parents, today you might be struggling. I, I'm starting to learn through a lot of different conversations that I've had over the years that I think the most difficult phase of parenting might be parenting adults, you know? When your kids have grown up and you feel like there's only so much you can do and you see them struggling, you see them hurting, I want to encourage you today that if that's where you find yourself at, I, I want you to know today you're doing better than you think you are. And by displaying committed love, 
you're going to have your moment. You're going to have your moment. God is faithful. Just keep on loving them with the same love that Jesus has for you. You're doing better than you think you are, and I want to encourage you. It's never too early, and it's never too late to start this process. I want you to keep hanging in there and love your kids the way that Jesus loves you because they're going to see that. It's going to make more of a difference than you know, and I promise you, I want to say this again, you're doing better than you think you are, so hang in there. I think it's important when uh, Paul wraps this idea up in 2 Timothy 1, he says this in verse 7, and this is a verse that many of you will recognize, and then you realize it's in this context. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. I think there's going to be moments, especially when you talk about the world of parenting or influencing the next generation, whatever that looks like in the world that you are finding yourself in right now, sometimes that can be overwhelming. It can be scary because you don't have all the right answers. You're not sure what the right move is, and yet you're expected to know, right? I want you to remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. He is walking right beside us. He's the God of hope. He's the God who, when we ask for wisdom, he gives it to us. I encourage you to embrace him, experience his power, his love, and his self-discipline. And with that in mind, I just encourage you to stick to the plan. You can do it. And you're doing better than you think you are. It's never too early, and it's never too late to start. If you've said yes to Jesus and you're surrendering everything to him, You're doing everything you can to model your faith and set a good example. You're doing everything you can at this point to stack the deck for success. I'm telling you, you're doing it. Stick to the plan. God is faithful, and he's going to show up. He's walking through this right there with you, and you can put your trust in him. So keep at it. I say it again. You're doing better than you think you are doing. And so I just want to ask this final question. Am I leading my family toward Jesus? I just want to challenge you today. Crossroads. This is too important of a question for us to just glaze over and miss. Man, I I encourage you to do everything you can in your power to, to be intentional about leading your family to Jesus, leading the people in your life who you have influence over, who look up to you. If you say something and you realize that when you speak, what you say has influence on persons more than any other people, use that influence for good. Let's start planting the seeds, investing in the next generation, making sure that that legacy of faith gets passed on because that's how we invest in eternity and that's a ripple that ripples through generations. We have no idea the amount of impact that each of us have just by planting that seed and and passing that faith on to our families. That's what makes a difference. That's what changes the world. And I encourage you to lean in and lead your family toward Jesus today. We talk about this idea of surrendering our families to Jesus. That's where it all starts. But I also want to encourage you today that that's where the relationship with Jesus begins as well. It's by realizing, Jesus, I need you. When you realize I'm walking through this journey of life and I am without hope. I've been struggling to find my identity, to figure out who I am, to figure out what this life is all about, to figure out what my eternal destiny is. I I want you to know today, you don't have to struggle with that. Jesus is the answer to all the questions that you've been searching for. I want to invite everyone here today to a changed life, to experience the hope of Jesus. And so as we prepare to close, I'm just going to give you a chance to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. Because these moments of surrender, they are sacred and they are beautiful and they change everything. So would you all stand with me together? In this moment, I invite everyone to pray this prayer out loud, but if you're praying this prayer for the first time, know that if you mean this in your heart, that when you speak this prayer, I want you to know that God is going to forgive you, he is going to set you free, and he's going to change everything. So can we all say this prayer together? It simply says this, Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins, and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I am saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. And can we give him the praise and the glory today because he is worthy. There is no one like him. Listen, if you said that prayer for the very first time, I want you to know today you're not alone. We already had people say yes to Jesus at our 8.30 service this morning. How cool is that? We're celebrating changed lives. People have said yes to Jesus. And if that was you just now, 
I want to invite you to come forward after the service is over. Come say hi to Keith. He's waving his hand to you. We've got a gift for you. We'd love to give you a Bible and help you figure out what your next steps are as you take this journey with Jesus because I believe Jesus changes everything and he is the one you've been looking for and we want to celebrate that with you. And so Crossroads, as we leave today, it's Mother's Day. I want to celebrate that with you and just encourage you. Let's be doing everything we can as a church family to lead our families toward Jesus and invest in that eternal future for them, all right? I'm going to pray a prayer over you and we'll be dismissed. Uh, I pray just the verse of Romans 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you put your trust in him. May you leave today overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Crossroads, you are loved. Happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next Sunday.